Cold Comfort, Book 3 of the America Falls series, written by Scott Medbury, narrated by Adam Barr. Part 3, 14. The next few days were full of routine for all of us. Luke began to work in the mines and seemed to thrive on the physical activity. Every evening we met in the rec room, and they would report what they had managed to stash for our planned escape. It seemed to be going well. They had squirreled enough butter knives for everyone, and Luke had managed to smuggle a small lump of granite into the room. After lights out, he had been busily using it as a whetstone to sharpen the blades of the dull knives. That wasn't all he managed to smuggle out. The third night after he began work in the mines, Luke pulled me into the alcove of the rec room. He was walking with a slight limp, and when he sat down next to me he had his legs stuck out at an odd angle. He appeared to be unable to bend his knee. My hopes suddenly crashed. We all needed to be fit and ready to run if this thing was to have even a hope of succeeding. What happened? How bad is it? I asked, already working through scenarios for dealing with a lame Luke. A secretive look passed over his face. When he was sure no one was looking, he snatched my hand and pushed it onto his upper thigh. Dude, what the hell? I snatched my hand away when I felt a hard, thick object under the material of his pants leg. He cracked up laughing, amused to the point where he fell back in hysterics. Don't worry, man, he said, wiping tears of mirth from his eyes. I don't have a woody for you. It's a woody for me. What? He waited until the few people who had looked around at his laughter went back to their business before he put his hand on his leg. He smoothed the material so that I could see the shape clearly. It was a shaft about two foot long and about an inch and a half in diameter. When he took his hands away, I could barely make it out. It's the handle of one of the makeshift picks we use when we mine. It's like a broom handle, but sturdier. It broke while I was mining, so I stashed it when the guards weren't looking. I was going to hide it in my mattress, but I didn't have a chance after work. Anyway, it was so worth the discomfort to see the look on your face. I'm glad I was able to amuse you, I said sarcastically. What do you think you're going to do with a broom handle? Sweep the professor's men off their feet? Not exactly. I'm going to make an assegai. I saw the weapons trivia king looking at me, waiting for me to ask. Okay, Luke, enlighten me. And ask what? He laughed, looking pleased with himself. Glad you asked. It's a Zulu weapon, a short stabbing spear. The Zulu used them in close quarters fighting. It'll be ideal for the corridors in here if we have to fight our way out. He made two quick violent stabbing motions to demonstrate how he would use it. Not bad. I won't ask how you're going to make it, but if you happen to make another one, I have dibs on it. Okay, he agreed. Same goes if you manage to get another gun. You got it. The next day, John and Bowman returned. Meeks and I happened to be completing our report at the duty desk when they were escorted in by two homeland guards, one of whom was Williams. Meeks stepped forward. We'll take it from here, he said, moving in front of Williams and planting a hand on his chest to block him from coming any further. Williams grabbed the smaller man's wrist and began to twist it as his partner stepped forward. I tensed, but John Hurst intervened. Easy, Meeks. We're fine. Just go and get the colonel. Meeks struggled for a few seconds longer until Williams flung his hand away, sending the soldiers stumbling backwards a step. Hurst stepped between them quickly. I said, get the colonel. He snapped at the red-faced Meeks. Meeks appeared ready to argue, but eventually turned after giving Williams a filthy look. John turned to Williams after Meeks disappeared around the corner. Thanks for escorting us down. We'll make our report to Colonel Randall. Williams gave John an ironic salute, then reached over and ruffled my hair rudely. How's it going, soldier boy? Be careful what company you keep. He gestured to his comrade and headed to the elevator. The effect of his condescending pat on the head was twofold. First, it made me feel like a little kid. Second, it came across as an implicit threat. I struggled to come up with a smart-ass reply. I did, 
just as the elevator doors opened and they stepped in. You be careful too, ma'am. Williams turned and looked towards me from inside the lift. Instead of the look of anger I had hoped to provoke, I saw instead mild amusement. He held my eye for a second before the doors closed. Self-doubt gripped me. What was I thinking? I was just a dumb kid out of my depth and he knew it. I felt John's hand on my shoulder. I knew he meant to help, but it didn't comfort me. Just reinforced my feelings of inadequacy. Colonel Randall bustled into the reception area. Hurst, Bowman, you're back. Come into the situation room so we can debrief. Race, you come too. Surprised, I fell in behind John and Bowman, who gave me a nod. His eyes had a haunted quality that I hadn't noticed before, and I began to wonder what they had seen outside. Meeks turned to follow as well. That will be all, Meeks. Go and have some leisure time. Meeks looked at me with a vaguely resentful expression, and I shrugged to say sorry, even though I had nothing to be sorry for. The colonel told us to sit as he closed the door behind us. I followed and sat on the opposite side of the table to the two men. Now that I had a chance to look more closely at them, both Bowman and John Hurst looked a little worse for wear. Give it to me, said Colonel Randall as he sat down next to me. They're gone, sir. We found three dead, two missing, presumed captured. Based on what was left of the vehicle, it looks like they were involved in a heavy firefight. I'd say they gave as good as they got. We found one wrecked Chinese vehicle, too. Where? A house uh, about a mile outside of Lincoln. It was the last of the stops on their mission. Ambush? No, I don't think so. The house is off the main highway from the south. More likely they were spotted and intercepted. More bad luck than design. Damn it. We couldn't afford to lose anybody, let alone five in one hit. Who are the dead? Somerton, Anders, and Beth Langdon. Randall seemed to consider this for a while before speaking. John, make sure the guys in the control room are informed of this new development. If the Chinese have their hands on the other two, it is certain they will be interrogated. We have to assume that our location could be compromised. Even if it's not, we can expect a lot more heat from the Chinese now that they have spotted surviving adults and soldiers at that. Yes, sir. We were dismissed not long after and I invited Bowman to come up to mid-level for a meal after he'd showered. Twenty minutes later, we sat down with our meals in the cafeteria. I had two reasons for inviting him. One, I felt like it was the right thing to do. He looked like he could do with the company. And two, I wanted to sound him out, subtly, about the possibility of him helping us escape. So, what do you think of the professor? I began. He's an asshole he said with no hesitation. Really? You think that too? I got the feeling him and Randall only tolerate each other. Oh yeah, there's bad blood there. I thought that last incident with Rag would blow it all up, but the problem is he holds all the cards. And as much as Randall hates him, he is old school when it comes to chain of command, and right now the professor is the supreme commander. Why doesn't Randall just take command? Surely he can't agree with policies like separating the women and, well, it just doesn't seem right. I had almost mentioned the experiments on Sonny and mentally kicked myself. Luckily, Bowman was busy eating and didn't ask me what I was going to say. He doesn't like it any better than any of us. But as I said, old school. What if someone decided they wanted to leave? You know, because they didn't want to live like this and thought they would rather take their chances outside. Bowman's fork halted on the way to his mouth. I had his attention now and wondered if I had said too much. Well, they'd be crazy. Why would anybody want to go out to that? Look at what just happened to the scouting party. The professor might be an asshole, but it's safe down here. Besides, even if someone did want to leave, there is no way they would allow it. It would be too big a risk for the facility. It's bad enough the Chinese got two of our soldiers. But a civilian would definitely crack under torture and give away our position. I didn't say anything. Please tell me you're not thinking of trying to leave. Oh, uh, uh, no, of course not. Was just curious is all. Good. 
it would be a dumb move. Omen went back to eating his meal and I mentally scrubbed him off my list. There would be no one to help us. In fact, if push came to shove, it may be that we would also have to fight Randall's men on the way out. I hoped it didn't come to that. Our discussion sobered me a little. He was right. There was only a 50% chance of escape. It would be even less if Homeland or Randall were alerted to our escape. I felt a black cloud of doubt settle over me as we finished eating and went into the rec room where Luke and the others were already relaxing. Having Bowman there as well meant that I probably wouldn't get much of a chance to talk with the others. It didn't improve my mood. Luke took the opportunity when it presented itself. Ben had invited Bowman to partner him in a game of pool, and Luke made his way to me and guided me into a corner of the main room. Why the long face, Chief? He asked. I shrugged. I was thinking, is all. I'm not sure we even have a small chance of succeeding. Dude, it's been that way all along. Don't get all hopeless on me now. What are our alternatives? Maybe we should just be thankful for what we have. We're safe, fed, and have a roof over our head. I'm sure that's what the Jews thought when they were taken to those nice, safe camps by the Nazis. He paused and let that sink in. You know, I saw footage once. It was a group of Jewish men being lined up, told to kneel in the street, before one soldier, just one with a pistol, walked up behind them one by one and shot them in the back of the head. Not even the last guy, knowing what was coming, stood up and fought or made a run for it. What did he have to lose? He could have at least made the bastard work for it. It made me angry, Isaac. Angry that he would just take a bullet in the head. But you know what? When I calmed down, I thought to myself that he couldn't fight. He was defeated. Defeated in spirit. He'd probably already seen his family killed and was happy to be out of it. Well, we're not defeated. And I'm not going to kneel down and wait for these assholes to impregnate the girls and make virtual slaves out of us. Neither are you. We're going to do it for Sonny. I must admit, his little speech gave me goosebumps. Luke would have been a great motivational speaker. He held out his fist and I gave him a knuckle bump. Okay, you're right. I guess I just didn't want anyone else to get hurt. Neither do I, man. But even if we stay down here in the ground like moles, what sort of life is it? You're already starting to look like Gollum. You ought to talk, ghost that walks. We laughed and stood up. The game had finished, and I could see Bowman looking around. Let's do it, I said quietly as we walked to the table. Four more days and we're out of here. Good call. By the way, Paul has talked to Toby and Bo. We didn't want to leave it any longer, and sooner or later they would have caught us smuggling weapons into the room. They're ready to roll and have no qualms about getting the hell out, too. Great. Did you get a message to the girls yet? Not yet. I'll get it written tonight and slip it to Indigo at the breakfast lineup tomorrow. I'm on early patrol. Fifteen. I retired early that night. I wanted to be back in the barracks before anyone else so I could get our plan on paper as well as write the note for Indigo. Thankfully, the rooms were empty. Apparently, the colonel had given permission for drinks in the lower-level breakout area that night. I thought it was a smart move, a way to say goodbye and remember the fallen from the scouting party. When I had heard about it, I actually considered moving forward the escape to the next morning. It would certainly help if half the soldiers in the facility were sleeping off a heavy night. In the end, I dismissed the idea. We just weren't ready yet. I sat on my bunk and took out the stub of pencil and carefully jotted down a rough timeline of our escape plan on a few sheets of toilet paper. 0245. Get up and use the cargo lift to get onto the middle level. 0250. Let the boys out of their dorm. Paul, Bo, and Toby to remain with the door propped open. 0300. Luke, Ben, and I head to the north wing to free the girls. 0305 to 0310. Arrive back with the girls and all head to the square and then into the lobby. 0315. 
neutralize any resistance in the lobby, freeing up the way to the exit. O320. I head to the lower level and take the control room while the rest make their way to the exit and neutralize the guards there. O325. Check monitors to ensure the group is ready and make sure no Chinese presence outside or in the lodge before opening both doors of the sally port. O325 to O340. Make sure the group is away safely and close the sally port and, if possible, sabotage the controls so that the group can't be followed. Stay as long as possible in the control room before handing myself over when the escape is discovered. Take what is coming. When I was done, I read over the timeline and felt another wave of doubt wash over me. The plan for the escape and survival of my group was written on something I would normally use to wipe my ass. Toilet paper and stolen cutlery. Our whole plan, our whole escape depended on toilet paper and sharpened butter knives, and if we were lucky, a couple of guns against trained, well-armed fighters. Before despair could again take me, I pushed those dangerous thoughts out of my mind and began to write my note to Indigo. I would hand it to her the next day. I couldn't write everything I wanted to, but my note was longer than the last one. Indigo, we are getting out of here. Luke, Ben, and I have come up with an escape plan. It will begin at 3 a.m. the day after tomorrow. I need you and the other girls to be ready and I need you to let the girl called Ava know as well. Her brother and his friends are coming with us. We're all escaping together. If you hear any sort of alarm or shots before we come for you, it means we've failed, and you should take the girls back to bed immediately. If it all goes well, though, the first thing you'll see or hear is us opening the doors to let you out. Remember, 3 a.m., be waiting for us. If things don't go well... I want you to know that I love you. That will probably creep you out, and I'm sorry, but I needed to say it. If I don't see you again, please do everything you can to protect the girls. Isaac, XX. I folded both the timeline and the note to Indigo and slipped them inside the cover of my pillow before laying down and trying to get to sleep. It was an impossible task, knowing that some of the people I loved could be dead within 48 hours. My partner for the morning's patrol was Meeks. If he had an issue with me being invited to hear Hearst's report by the colonel, he didn't show it that morning. Even though I was sure he had drunk lots the night before, he was talkative. Too talkative, in fact. His chatter about stuff from before didn't bore me exactly, because he could actually tell a really good story but it certainly interfered with my ability to think, and I felt like I needed every second I could get. We circled mid-level for the fourth time, looking at the same walls, floor, and ceiling that had been my entire world for nearly a month. There is no way I would be able to do this for the rest of my life, I thought to myself. Even if things were idyllic, if the professor wasn't some sort of twisted despot and we were all living together happily, at some point not too far in the future... I'm pretty sure I would have had to leave. It was a big, empty country, and the Chinese couldn't watch all of it. There had to be somewhere we could go to live in relative peace and safety. A hideaway, but not like the facility. Not a concrete box, but a place where we could feel the sun on our faces and the grass under our feet. Funny how in my mind it was still we, even though I would not be going with them. I looked at my patrol partner. I'm pretty sure Meeks didn't have the same problem. With the help of his hip flask and a friendly ear, he would have been happy circling the facility like a hamster on a wheel forever. I let the drone of his voice wash over me as I began to fantasize about what might happen if we were successful. I imagined my group climbing out of a hatch on the mountaintop and making their way into a green, lush valley where they would find a farmhouse surrounded by acres of tall wheat. I knew it was impossible now that I had to stay behind. But I imagine Indigo and I were there together, holding hands on a veranda as we looked at children playing on the impossibly green grass of a neat lawn. Luke and Brooke were next to us, also holding hands. Allie, Ben, Paul, and his group were there, too. 
The shrill noise of Reveille snapped me out of my daydream, and for the umpteenth time my hand went into my pocket and confirmed that Indigo's note was still there. They would come through in about ten minutes. I picked up my pace a little to ensure that we would be at the right stage of our circuit when the girls filed past. Meeks continued his monologue without skipping a beat. So he took the pickup and went out shooting hogs. I went back to my musings as he continued, almost subconsciously nodding and saying the occasional, really? At the right places. My utopian daydream had given me food for thought. While I was under no illusions that my group would escape unscathed, if they did make it, they would have to work out where to go. The farmhouse sounded great, but then John and Bowman's story had spooked me a little. They would just have to make sure they were more careful than the party that had been attacked by the Chinese. I decided that probably the best scenario would be for them to head back into Lincoln and lay low there for two days or so, until they were sure that the Drake Mountain personnel had given up on them. They could raid supermarkets and convenience stores, even homes for supplies. All they would have to do is keep clear of the Chinese, which wouldn't be easy, considering the intel John and Bowman had brought back from their mission, and the possibility of newly alert Chinese on the lookout for survivors. I also decided that, no matter what, if I managed to survive the punishment after aiding my group's escape, I would do everything in my power to get out of there too, no matter how long it took. I would query Paul about the possibility of them returning to his home after they left the lodge. He might say no. We hadn't really talked about what had happened to his parents, but I had to assume their bodies had been left behind. If not, I thought it would be easy enough to find somewhere else for them to hole up. Lucky the weather is still cool, I thought to myself. I didn't like the thought of them walking into a house containing bodies in the middle of summer. Finally, Meeks and I rounded the corner and we were back in the main corridor of the square. I slowed my pace as we walked by the cafeteria. Good, the girls hadn't arrived yet. I initiated a new conversation with Meeks to hide my snail-like speed. So, you used to hunt a lot? Off he went again, newly invigorated, as I saw the first homeland guard come around the corner about thirty feet ahead of us. To allow them past, Meeks and I fell into single file. I deliberately let him lead and with my adrenaline pumping, I scanned each face as they came into view, only slightly distracted as Meeks doffed a non-existent cap. Ladies, he said in an unintentionally creepy manner. There she was. I palmed the note and transferred it to my left hand. There was no smile from Indigo this morning. In fact, as we neared each other, I saw that Allie, who was directly behind her, had red-rimmed eyes, and only Brooke bringing up the rear was able to manage a smile, albeit a tepid one. I had to hope that it was only the news about Sonny that was upsetting them. Anything else that might be happening didn't bear thinking about. Indigo's hand brushed mine and I slipped her the folded message. I was about to congratulate myself when Allie crashed into me, sobbing heavily as her arms encircled my neck. Oh, Isaac, Sonny. I held her tight as she cried into my shoulder. Thankfully, her words were muffled, and for the moment at least, none of the homeland guards had noticed her. Shh, I know, I whispered, as I saw Meeks turning to see why the line had come to a stop. To his credit, he didn't approach us, but instead moved to block the homeland guard at the rear of the column who had started running for us. Don't worry, we'll make them pay. I said quietly into her ear as Brooke and Indigo gently extricated her from me and guided her back into the line. Brooke gave my arm a squeeze and they started moving again. I cursed myself for not asking Indigo to keep the news about Sonny from Allie. I should have thought about how upset the younger girl would be. Sonny had saved her life and those of the other kids while the flu decimated the country. Afterwards, he had kept them safe from the Chinese and other dangers. She had been with him the entire time, and he had become a surrogate father to her. Now, with Sonny gone and the others who had been killed or left behind, Allie was the last of her original group. The Homeland Guard finally pushed past Meeks, eyeing us threateningly. It was Maddox. He had nothing to confront us about, though 
The girls had moved on without any more fuss, the sound of Ellie's sobbing now receding into the distance. I stared the bigger man down, almost daring him to make a move. Perhaps he saw something he didn't like, or perhaps he didn't think it worth the effort. But eventually he shuffled past me without saying a word. I moved on as the last few stragglers, one of them Paul's sister, went past. She looked even more pregnant than the last time I'd spotted her a few days ago, and even more unhappy. Meeks waited for me and stepped in beside me as we continued on our patrol. I waited for the inevitable questions. He surprised me a little by not jumping straight in. Are you okay? Yeah, I said, surprised and embarrassed when tears sprung to my eyes. Looking back, I guess I hadn't really finished my own grieving for Sonny, and the raw grief from Allie seemed to trigger something in me. Suddenly I was angry. Angry at the situation. Angry at the professor and his cronies. Angry at myself for displaying weakness when, right then, in just a few hours, I needed strength. I shook Meek's comforting hand from my shoulder and turned to the wall. Fuck. I am so over this shit. I punched the concrete wall, punctuating each word with a muffled, fleshy exclamation mark. Meeks pulled me away before I could do too much damage, but my unhappy rage left blood splatters on the pristine white wall. I struggled, and Meeks surprised me yet again, this time by pulling me into a bear hug. To this day, I'm not sure if it was to restrain me or comfort me or both, but I am grateful. Calm down, Isaac, he said firmly. My outburst seemed to have done the trick. The pain in my hand cut through the red fog of anger and grief, and I let the soldier hold me a moment longer. I'm okay, I whispered as I pushed away. Show me your hand. I held out my hand, palm down. Three of my knuckles were bloody, but I could tell I hadn't broken anything. Calmer now, I cursed my stupidity. The last thing I needed would be to be incapacitated in any way during the escape. As it was, I was lucky. The bruising would be painful, but it shouldn't impede me if I found myself in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation. Meeks assessed my injury by watching my face as he moved my fingers separately of each other. He seemed satisfied when I did not wince or complain. Well, no major damage, but it will be sore for a few days. I'll get you a few days' worth of Tylenol when we finish our shift. So what's the story, or don't you want to talk about it? Meeks had been so reasonable, so different to the Meeks I thought I knew, that I told him everything. I explained why Allie had been so upset, and also what we had found out about Sonny. It felt so good to get it off my chest to be telling someone outside our group that I also told him of our plans for the escape. I knew the information was safe. Meeks hated the professor and the homeland guards as much as we did. He listened in relative silence asking a few questions here and there. I told him it would take place early the next morning. As I spoke, I began to realize that I was giving away a lot and became much more circumspect. In the end, Meeks only knew that it was kicking off at 3 a.m. the next morning, but nothing about the weapons or the mechanics of the actual escape plan. I've said too much, haven't I? Please, Meeks. Even if you don't agree with what we're doing, don't say anything. We need to have total surprise on our side. It's okay, Isaac. I won't say a thing. I won't say it's a mistake, either. I know you thought this through. There's no way I would want to go, though. I want to be here when the colonel finally gets Jack of Leahy and all his bullshit. There's a bullet in my gun with William's name on it. Fair enough. You sure, then? Down here, your people have food, water, shelter, and security. It's a real risk you'll be taking. A few of them could die. I thought for a few seconds before I answered. Yeah, I'm sure. Not about dying being better, but we have to try. The professor killed one of us for an experiment, nothing more. That tells me that he's bad. Two of the girls in the North Wing are pregnant, and who knows how many more there will be. Haven't you ever wondered why the females are kept separate to us? This whole thing is like the Garden of Eden for him, and he thinks he's God. 
but he's really the snake. I agree. He is a sick, evil son of a bitch. You know that you'll have to kill to get them out, right? And you'll be neck deep in shit for helping them after they're gone. Once again, Meeks gave me pause to think. I didn't care about what would happen to me, but of course I thought about the possibility of having to kill again. But not too hard. My mind had skirted around the issue, imagining that we could take the homeland guards by surprise and maybe tie or lock them up. But deep inside, I knew it wouldn't work out so bloodlessly. Yeah, I know. We'll try to do it without spilling blood, but I know that's a long shot. Okay, well, good luck. I hope they make it. 16. We finished our shift a few hours later and went back to the lower level. I spent an hour or so showering and then chatting to a few of the guys. I made the final preparations for early the next morning, putting my boots under my bed and fresh uniform under the covers. I also had a small backpack that I'd stocked with a canteen of water and some packets of beef jerky. Dawes had insisted on giving me the supplies when I told him I'd been getting pretty hungry on patrol the day before, hoping he'd give me a few packs of beef jerky. Here, you may as well take a canteen, too. We have enough to see out the end of the world. Oh, wait, that's what we're doing. Here, you may as well take a backpack to put it all in, too. The backpack went in beside the boots, and I headed up to the mid-level to meet up with Ben, Luke, and the others. Our last chance to talk before zero hour. I didn't stop to eat an entire meal. I was too nervous and just grabbed a bread roll with a slice of cheese and went straight into the rec room. It was more crowded than usual with off-duty soldiers, but there were no homeland personnel around. While we had seen more and more of them since the confrontation a week before, they still mainly kept to the upper level when they weren't on duty. We were unable to secure the sofa in the alcove as we usually did, so most of our talking was done as we waited around watching the action on the pool table. Luke looked happy, a stark contrast to my own feeling of apprehension. Aren't you nervous? I asked. Sure, but I'm just happy that it's finally happening. I don't know how much more of this place I can take. I don't think I was designed to be cooped up for too long. Same. We have to do this, right? Yes, he said emphatically. Don't second-guess yourself, Isaac. We've gone through all the reasons, and you know it's the right thing to do. We have to take our chances and decide our own fate. Otherwise, it was all for nothing, and we could have just handed ourselves over to the Chinese when they invaded. Once again, my friend's eloquence strengthened my resolve. Okay, you're right. I may have said a little too much to my patrol partner, Meeks. Luke looked at me as Ben handed me the pool cue. One sec, I said, and turned to take my shot. Luke wasn't happy. What did you say to him? I didn't give him any details, but I basically told him the outline of our whole plan. Dude, what were you thinking? We need the element of surprise if we are going to pull this thing off, you know? I know. I'm sorry. I was having a tough time with something, and, and well, it doesn't matter now. He knows. But he was okay with it even though he doesn't think it's a good idea. We can trust him. He didn't say anything for a few moments, but I felt the heaviness of disappointment in his silence. I took another shot as he weighed up what I had told him. He seemed to be over it by the time I returned. Okay, I understand you trust him, but we can't take any chances. I want to bring our plans forward by half an hour. I don't think we should tell anyone else, though, not even the other guys. I'm down with that. But how will it work if we don't say anything? Well, you and I are the linchpins of the operation. We just move earlier, wake the other boys, and start the ball rolling. I thought about this. It made sense and wouldn't change things dramatically, other than giving us a head start in case of any interference as a result of my indiscretion. Okay, that should work. Wait, what about the girls? It won't change anything other than the fact that we may need to go in and get them rather than have them waiting for us. Knowing Indigo, she will probably have them ready to roll earlier anyway. Okay. We knuckle-bumped and returned to the game. 
I managed to talk quietly with Ben and Paul. They too were ready, although Paul seemed a little withdrawn as though something was on his mind. I put it down to nerves and concern for his sister. We had fun for the next few hours playing pool and horsing around. The nervous energy made us all a little crazy, I think. As I watched them playing and laughing, I couldn't help wondering if it was the last time we would enjoy each other's company in such a place of safety. Or at all. We said our goodnights quite early. Luke slipped his iPhone to me as we went out. I went to bed fully clothed in the uniform I had stashed. As I slipped under the cover, the phone was beside my pillow, set to vibrate and the alarm programmed for 2.15 instead of 2.45. My taser and pistol were under my pillow, and I planned to steal at least one more of each when I awoke. More if I could. Everything was ready. 17. I was at home, eating breakfast. We were all there at our kitchen table. Dad was in his suit and tie, sipping coffee, occasionally sweeping his fringe out of his eyes as he read the morning paper. Mom looked beautiful, her dark hair back in a ponytail as she held her toast in one hand and tapped out a message on her phone with the other. She was in her workout gear, ready to head to the gym after she dropped me and Rebecca to school. Rebecca was noisily eating her Fruit Loops, her hair tangled and waiting unsuspectedly for Mom's brush of pain. I felt comforted in the familiar routine of it, the warm comfort that only a kid can feel in the arms of his family, the warm comfort of innocence. But behind that, there was something else, something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Maybe it was why they wouldn't look at me. No matter how much I tried to catch their eye, I couldn't. Had I done something to upset them? That wasn't all, though. There was something else. I couldn't speak. I didn't try because somehow I knew that if I did, no words would come out anyway. It was almost as if I wasn't there. Wait, that was it. I wasn't there. It didn't make me sad. I was more curious than anything and contented myself with watching them as they went about their morning routine. It was strangely wonderful, and I felt I could be quite content to sit there forever. Mom's phone began to vibrate on the table. Why wasn't she answering it? I felt myself getting upset. She should really answer it. I struggled to speak and found that I could after all. Answer it, Mom. My eyes snapped open. My heart was racing. I had spoken the words aloud and woken myself up. I snatched up the iPhone, swiping the alarm off and held my breath, waiting for a sign that I'd woken anyone. Nothing. No one said anything and all I could hear was Bowman's soft snoring from the bunk above me. I exhaled slowly and waited a few minutes, just to be sure, before sitting carefully and slipping my feet to the floor. I paused again when the bed squeaked, and then put my boots on as carefully as I could. Standing, I put on my pistol belt and clipped on the taser. I quickly moved to the foot of the bunk where Bowman's pistol belt was draped. I didn't breathe as I unclipped the holster cover and slid the weapon out. I couldn't find his taser and wasn't willing to risk waking anyone to find one. I pulled my small backpack from under the bed and slipped the weapon inside before pulling it onto my back. As I closed the door to the barracks behind me, my heart was already beating hard. Adrenaline was pumping through my system, and all I had done was basically get out of bed and walk through a door. I deliberately paused a few seconds and made myself calm down with a breathing technique I had learned in Kung Fu training. I didn't want to pay the price later by allowing all my nervous energy to be taxed before we even got into real danger. When I felt I had my nerves under enough control, I took off as quickly as possible and headed to the storeroom. While I had access to the storeroom, there would be little of any use that I could take without weighing myself down unnecessarily. 
More weapons were out of the question. They were locked in a cage, and Sergeant Dawes was the only one with a key. The nighttime lighting of the facility was a strange, dim yellow, and the empty corridors on the way to the storeroom reminded me of those in a video game I had played a few times with my friend Tommy. F.E.A.R. had a little girl's ghost that appeared in the corridors during very suspenseful moments of the game. It had freaked us both out. Not to the point where we stopped playing, but it certainly had added another dimension to the gameplay. But I wasn't freaked out now, just determined. I swiped myself into the storeroom and walked purposefully to the cargo lift at the rear. I stopped briefly to sweep a shelf full of beef jerky into my backpack, and then, just as I was about to reach the elevator, I saw a large plastic baggie of zip ties on the bottom shelf. Mother load. I slipped the bag into the backpack and pressed the call button for the elevator. While I waited, I unclipped my taser and held it loosely in my hand. The worst scenario would be for the lift doors to open and reveal someone in there. It was empty and I stepped in and pressed the button for mid-level. Now I just had to hope that the doors didn't happen to open at the exact time the patrol was passing. I wouldn't let bad luck get in the way, though. I tensed, raising the taser as the elevator car slowed and came to a halt. The doors opened quietly onto an empty corridor. Good. I peered both ways before stepping out. This would be the hard part negotiating my way to the dormitory while avoiding the patrol. I followed the corridor that ran parallel to the one that had the main entrance of the cafeteria and rec room. I paused at the corner. This turn would take me through the quiet area and then onto the main passage to my destination. I listened, but couldn't detect any conversation or the sound of footsteps. It seemed luck had come down on my side this time. I padded over the carpet and again paused before heading into the main corridor. Another two turns, and I was safely into the east wing. I arrived at the boy's door and pulled out the iPhone. It was 221. I swiped my card and found them in various stages of undress. Hey, I said, not really knowing what else to say. Everyone responded with a hey, except Paul. Luke woke us and told us you'd be early, What's going on? He looked puzzled and nervous. I put it down to the fact that he had just woken up and was about to embark on an escape attempt that could turn deadly, which was totally understandable. Um, yeah, we had to change plans for security reasons. Paul hovered around as Luke stepped up, fully dressed, of course, and gave me a knuckle bump. Chief, you pumped? He had a sharpened knife strapped to his thigh and a handful that he had been handing out to the other boys as they finished dressing. Behind him I could see his makeshift assegai standing against his cot. I had to hand it to him. It looked plenty deadly. Yeah, pumped. Probably not as convinced as I sounded. The small but sharpened knives suddenly didn't look convincing, especially when I thought about the firepower that could be brought against us if things went pear-shaped. Here. I shook off my backpack and pulled out the Beretta that I had stolen. You rock, Chief. I watched as he expertly ejected the clip, making sure it was full before slamming it back into place and aiming at the door, one hand bracing the other and getting a feel for it. He squeezed off a couple of imaginary rounds and slid it into the waistband of his pants. I'm all set. Just going to finish giving out the knives. Paul approached, looking serious. I don't think we should go yet. What if the girls aren't ready? Too late now, I said. If the girls aren't waiting for us, we will go into the rooms and find them. He bit his lip and I thought he looked a little desperate. Is everything okay? I asked. Yeah, yes, of course. Just a little jumpy, I guess. I still think we should wait, though. You wouldn't want anyone else in the North Wing raising the alarm. Dude, said Luke coming over and handing Paul one of the sharpened knives. It'll be okay. They'll be ready even if we are early. Indigo is organized like that. Paul, the worried look still on his face, seemed to give up and nodded, taking the knife and tucking it into his belt before going back over to Bo and Toby. The nervousness I was feeling was compounded by Paul's demeanor, and I felt a vague sense of disquiet fall over me. Ben approached us. Okay, lads. Are we all set? Yeah, let's do it, I said. 
a little distracted as I watched Paul put his shoes on. I shrugged off my uneasiness. I had to trust that everything was okay. Excellent, said Luke. He went to the bed and picked up his Zulu spear. Okay, let's go. Ben, you hang behind us. Luke and I have the firepower. So if things go south quick, we'll use them. What's our plan of attack? I will head up the last corridor to the entrance of the North Wing alone. These guys know me from the patrol, so I should be able to get close enough to use the taser on one. While he's on his way down, I'll draw my gun on the other. Sounds good. Yep, sounds great, Chief. Let's roll. I turned to the others. Guys, we're heading out. If it all goes to plan, we should be back in around ten minutes. If we're not back in that time, you might want to lock the door again because it would mean we fell at the first hurdle. They saw us to the door, Paul carrying the piece of cardboard he would use to prevent the bolt of the lock engaging. We'll be ready, said Paul, his face now unreadable. As I checked the corridor both ways, the vague sense of uneasiness I felt grew a little worse. I put it down to nerves and shrugged it off before gesturing for Luke and Ben to follow me. Paul closed the door behind us. I led the way, stopping every now and then to listen and make sure the patrol wasn't in the vicinity. Again, we were lucky enough to avoid them and arrived at the last corner before the North Wing entrance in about two minutes. We came to a stop, and even though it was unnecessary, I put a finger to my lips to indicate the other guy should be quiet. Luke rolled his eyes as if to say, Duh. They both squatted with their backs against the wall while I took off my backpack and opened it, pulling out two of the zip ties and handing them to Luke. He indicated that he wanted another, and I looked at him with a question in my eyes. He just nodded to hurry me up. I shrugged and gave him a third, then put my backpack against the wall next to him. I unclipped the taser from my belt, and I stood up straight hiding the immobilizing weapon in my hand. Luke and Ben gave me a thumbs up, and I took a deep breath before rounding the corner. I was expecting the Homeland Guards to be standing when I entered the corridor, and was surprised to find them sitting on their haunches with a deck of cards on the linoleum floor between them. Their heads snapped up when I appeared, but they soon relaxed when they recognized me. One raised his eyebrows to the other as if to say, what does this punk want? Even better, they stayed right where they were, one looking at his hand of cards while the other eyed me lazily. I picked him as my first target. Oh, hey, I began as I closed it within a few feet. I was just wondering if... I pressed the trigger on the handheld taser and lunged at him. The blue arc came to life with a crackle. His eyes had barely widened in surprise before the weapon was jammed up against his neck and he fell to the linoleum convulsing. I let the taser clatter to the floor and drew my Beretta, aiming it at his buddy's face. He had shot to his feet and was desperately trying to free his own weapon. Don't. He didn't argue. His hands went up and I whistled. Ben and Luke came running as I ordered the Homeland Guard to turn and put his hands against the wall. Nice work, said Luke. He went straight to the guy against the wall and told him to put his arms behind his back. What the fuck do you think you're doing? asked the guard with his face squashed against the wall. Hush, said Luke, smacking the back of the guard's head. I suppressed a nervous giggle at Luke's spontaneous treatment of our captive. He quickly secured the tie around his wrists and zipped it tight. Meanwhile, Ben tied my taser victim's hands in the same fashion. The fallen guard was moaning now and the convulsions had abated. I kept my gun ready in case of further resistance. Why did you want three ties? I asked Luke when he had finished and spun the guard around. Watch. He pushed down on the guard's shoulder. Sit, please. Fuck you. This time Luke punched him in the gut, and the bigger guy bent over, gasping for breath. Please, sit down. This time the guard did as he was told, and after some awkward maneuvering, Ben and Luke managed to get the men into sitting positions and back to back. Luke then used the third zip tie to loop through the two ties already around their hands. There you go. They're not going anywhere. Well done, I said, picking up my taser and handing it to Ben. If they start calling out or giving you any trouble, use this on them. It would be my pleasure, said Ben, 
unable to resist pressing the trigger so that the blue arc of electricity crackled to life. Come on, I said to Luke, and we went to the double doors the Homeland guys had been guarding. I swiped my card, but the little indicator light stayed red. I tried it again, no good. Luke was already running back to the captive guards. I began to feel a little desperate now, imagining that at any moment the patrol might pass and see what we were up to. I didn't want a confrontation this early in the game. Luke was back in a second with one of their cards. I held my breath as he swiped it. Thankfully, it went green this time, and I pushed the doors open carefully. The lights were dimmer in here, the same pale yellow as on the lower level. The corridor continued a little way past the doors before opening into a large, carpeted area with a scattering of sofas and beanbags. Something caught my eye. A slight movement at the far corner on the right. It was gone just as I saw it. I think that was Indigo, whispered Luke, who had a better angle than me. She was peeking around the corner. Indigo! My breathing quickened as we neared the corner carefully. Luke went around first, his assegai held out before him. I followed him. It was Indigo. She must have been waiting. We could see her at the end of another narrower corridor, urgently ushering the other girls along. They were all there. Brooke, Allie, and Paul's sister Ava. We waved at them to follow and stepped back around the corner as they reached us. Luke lowered his weapon and I barely had time to turn around before they were upon us. Allie made a beeline for me and fell into my arms just as Brooke reached Luke, grabbing him in a bear hug. Ava hung back, looking a little lost, and Indigo smiled at me over Allie's shoulder. She smiled. Hopefully that meant she hadn't been disgusted by the declaration of love on my last note. I felt myself redden as Allie finally released me from her grip of death, and Indigo stepped forward. She then did the most wonderful thing. She fell into my arms and kissed me on the lips. Now I know what they mean when they say the earth moved. I felt the most amazing feeling of well-being rush over me, and I kissed her back. My first real kiss. Even then, in that magical moment, I half expected that she might suddenly pull away and reject me. Okay, lovebirds, we have to go. Luke's voice sounded like it was coming from a very distant place, like I was at the bottom of a deep well and he was calling down to me. Indigo broke away from the kiss and I reluctantly released her, looking around at the grinning faces of Luke, Allie, and Brooke. Even Ava was smiling shyly at us. I felt my face burn with embarrassment as I slowly came back to reality. All right, I said gruffly. Let's go. I led the way back to the entrance and pulled the doors closed when everyone had passed through. Ben was where we had left him, the captive guard sitting quietly at his feet. No problems? I asked. No, they have been as quiet as church mice. Good. I looked at Luke and gestured to the doors. Should we leave them in there? Not a bad idea. If the patrol spots them here the way they are, they will raise the alarm. If they're not at their post, they might just report the anomaly when they get back after their patrol. Three minutes later, Ben, Luke, and I had them in the corridor behind the doors. Thankfully, they had kept quiet. Should we taser them? Ben asked, obviously keen for some action. It might keep them quiet for a bit longer. Easy, Ben. They'll be fine here. The patrol swipe cards won't work on this door, so even if they wanted to, they wouldn't be able to open these doors. No need to risk permanently damaging these guys. I saw the mouthy one open his mouth, possibly to threaten us, but then he seemed to think better of it and looked at the floor. Let's go, Luke said. 18. We took off at a moderate pace. Again, I led the way. Behind me trailed the girls, with Ben and Luke bringing up the rear. So... What's the plan? Indigo asked, her eyes bright with excitement. Even with the fading bruise on her face, she looked beautiful in the dim light. We're going back to collect the other group. Paul, that's Ava's brother, and his two friends Bo and Toby. I paused as we reached an intersection, gesturing everyone to be quiet. I peeked around the corner to the left and quickly pulled my head back. 
I had seen the patrol passing along the corridor running parallel to ours. That meant in a few minutes they would be rounding another corner and traveling up the corridor where they would intersect with the North Wing Passage. I checked once more and then said urgently, Come on. We darted around the corner to the right, a little more urgency in our step. And after we pick up the boys? Indigo prompted, puffing a little because of the fast pace. Well, then we head towards the exit. We're going to have to make a stand at the lobby. We can't get to the exit without going past. If, when, we get past that obstacle, we're home free. There was no way I was going to tell her now that I wasn't going with them. I would leave that unhappy news until the last possible minute. Thankfully, we arrived back at the dorm before she could ask me any more questions. Perhaps because I was thinking about Indigo, or maybe just because things were moving too quickly, I didn't stop at the door to the boys' room even though I had a bad feeling. I ignored my spider sense, as Luke called it, and just pushed it open and took a step into the room and froze. Believe it or not, Paul was the first person I looked at. He was standing near the rear of the dormitory with Toby and Bo standing beside him. They wore shocked expressions, but it was Paul that drew my gaze. The shamed expression on his face told me all I needed to know. I felt the heavy pain of betrayal in my belly, even as my mind began working furiously to find a way out of this mess. So it's true then. I didn't want to believe it. The professor sat on Luke's cot, and next to him stood Mr. Rag, his face expressionless. There were two Homeland Guards in the room as well, Bradley and the heavyset Maddox. Both had their weapons drawn and trained on me. I wondered briefly where Williams was. I pushed against Indigo with my back, moving to the center of the doorway in order to obscure the line of fire. Don't bother, Isaac. You'll find that Leroy is in the corridor behind you. He has orders to shoot if any of you try to run. I looked over my shoulder at Luke. He turned and looked into the corridor before nodding to me, his mouth a grim line. Good. Now, why don't you all come in so we can have a little chat about this escapade? Part of me wanted to scream but I deliberately forced myself to remain calm. This wasn't over yet. Keeping my hands by my side, I took a few steps into the room. Indigo hesitated. Come in, young lady. There is nowhere else to go. The rest of the group filed in, and the professor called over our heads. Leroy, make sure we're not disturbed, please. Yes, sir. Leroy shot me a smug look as he pulled the door closed. I turned back as the professor stood. Now, put your weapons on the floor, please. Reluctantly, I unclipped my belt and bent over, placing it on the floor. The rest did the same with their sharpened knives, and Luke also put down his handmade spear and knife. And that was all. His gun was tucked into the back of his pants, they didn't know he had it, and they couldn't see it from where they were standing. The professor clasped his hands behind his back and began to walk to and fro in front of us, much like a school principal may have done in front of misbehaving students. Now what are we to do with you, my friends? He asked when he finally came to a halt and faced us. If not for the sense your friend, young Paul, displayed by coming to me, you may well have catastrophically breached the security of this facility. Oh, Paul. Ava's soft voice came from behind me. We're not your friends. And frankly, Paul is no friend either. Friends don't betray each other, I said bitterly. Paul flinched. Isaac, it wasn't like that. I had to protect Ava. She... And what you can do is let us go. Right now. I interrupted Paul, continuing to address the professor. The professor's eyes widened. I think he was expecting fear and regret, perhaps a little begging. Not steely resolve and demands. Luke chimed in. And make it quick if you don't want your mad scientist ass kicked. There was a long silence, 
finally broken when the professor laughed. He laughed hard, bending over double until tears were streaming from his eyes. The two Homeland officers were smiling as if they were in on the joke, but I could tell they had no clue. Rag just stared at me. Finally, the professor's maniacal laughing petered out, and he wiped the tears from his eyes. When he looked at us again, his smile was gone. I didn't like what had replaced it. Oh, you too. I thought you were intelligent. We're smart enough to know that you killed Sonny, I said. If my words had an effect, they didn't show. Luke's next sentence did, though. And to know that you have a new virus that you're going to use on the Chinese. I saw a telltale flush on the professor's neck, but I also saw a change come over his face now that the cat was out of the bag. You're right. I have. I have engineered the key to getting our country back, and your friend Sonny was instrumental in enabling me to perfect it. You see, we had retro-engineered the flu virus within a month of the attack, and it wasn't difficult to engineer a new Sino variant. But we lacked the rat we needed to test it on. Then, of course, you arrived, a fortuitous turn of events, almost as if God had planned it that way. You crazy fuck, said Luke. Oh, don't worry. I'll make sure that your friend is recognized for his service to the country when we have this great nation back on its feet. But as for you, you must be punished for your sabotage, your treason. Mr. Rag, make an example of Mr. Race, please. Here, while everyone is watching. Mr. Rag crossed the floor quickly and gripped me by the upper arm. Of all the men in the facility, he was the only one that physically intimidated me. I didn't resist. Not because of fear. That wouldn't stop me. No, it was because I didn't see the point right then. I allowed him to drag me into the center of the room and push me to my knees. It was imperative I didn't try to resist before I saw an opening that might afford me at least a small chance of success. No! Paul rushed from the back of the room, racing past Maddox and Bradley before they could react. He grabbed Rag's arm. Professor, you said no one would get hurt. Well, I actually said your friends wouldn't be harmed. Mr. Race just stated quite clearly that he is not your friend. Continue, Mr. Rag. Paul became frantic. He wouldn't let go of Rag's arm. No, you promised. I saw the opening I was waiting for as Paul's struggles distracted Rag. With one swift movement, I turned and aimed a rabbit punch at his groin. His reaction time was fantastic, though. He managed to turn ever so slightly, my fist glancing off his thigh before hitting its mark. The resulting punch wasn't incapacitating, but it hurt. He nimbly stepped out of my reach, pushing Paul in the chest as he went. The smaller boy went flying through the air and landed against Luke's cot, the back of his head crashing into the metal frame with a sickening thud. Apparently, Luke had been awaiting his own opportunity, and as Rag stalked back towards me, my friend stepped away from the rest of our group and strode just as quickly towards the professor, his beretta aimed at the man's forehead. I wouldn't if I were you. The two homeland guards, distracted by the scuffle, were too slow to stop Luke. They looked tentative as they turned their weapons on him. For the moment I dismissed them. Rag had stopped dead in his tracks, his intense gaze now on Luke, who stood just a foot away from the professor. I saw the lethal man's brain ticking over as he tensed. Despite the risk, I could tell he was going to make a move, and it would be a swift, deadly one. Just shoot him, Luke, now! My shout had the desired effect. Rag hesitated. Stand down, Mr. Rag! The professor said. Like a deactivated Terminator, Mr. Rag suddenly relaxed and stood up straight, his hands falling to his side. I got to my feet. And those two, said Luke, waving his weapon in the general direction of the two homeland guards. Put your guns down, the professor ordered. On the floor, said Luke, and kick them away. I went across to Paul giving Rag a wide berth. I put two fingers against his throat, gratified to feel a strong pulse. There was blood pouring from a cut on the crown of his head and his glasses were hanging from one ear. The left lens cracked. 
I felt soft movement beside me as his sister crouched down. She placed her hand on his forehead and looked at me, her eyes filled with concern. Is he okay? He'll be fine. It's superficial, but we'll bleed a lot. He didn't do it to hurt you. I nodded, not sure yet how I felt about Paul. His treachery was a massive blow to us, but that didn't make it any easier to see him hurt. I can't let you leave, said the professor in a measured voice. You don't have a choice, asshole, Luke said grimly. I picked up the gun that Bradley had placed on the floor. Ben, tie these two up, please, the same way we did earlier. Toby, help Ava get Paul to his feet. Ben approached with my backpack. He had been carrying it since we had freed the girls. When he placed it on the floor and opened it to get some of the nylon ties, I reached in and grabbed two as well before walking over to Rag. I kept the gun trained on him as I approached warily. Turn around and put your hands behind your back. He just looked at me with those snake eyes of his. Dead. No feeling behind them. Luke, I said. Luke stepped forward and this time placed the muzzle of the gun against the professor's forehead. Rag! The professor whined in a shrill voice. Rag didn't take his eyes off me. Soon. He whispered ominously, before turning around and holding his hands behind him. I didn't say anything, just tucked the Beretta into my waistband and very carefully looped the zip tie around his wrists, pulling it tight, tighter than it needed to be, before leading him over to Luke's cot and forcing him to sit. Paul was by this time up on his feet, propped up by his concerned sister and Toby. He looked pretty out of it. Meanwhile, Ben had secured the two homeland guys together and with the help of Bo, had forced them to the back of the dorm and pushed them into the bathroom before pulling the door shut. Now you, Professor. Luke lowered his gun and the professor took a step towards me and turned, holding out his hands. I quickly secured them, a little more gently than I had rags, and sat him down on the cot next to his baleful henchman. Now, this is what's going to happen, I said. In a moment, you're going to call Leroy in, and then we're going to leave you all in here while we get out of this place. There's no need for anyone else to get hurt. I'm afraid I simply can't allow that to happen. I can't let you compromise the security of everyone in the facility. I stared at the professor, flabbergasted. You don't have a choice, professor. Look around. You won't get out alive, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. I gestured that the girls should move further into the room. Whatever. I'm not arguing with you. Call Leroy in, please. He did as I asked, and a few seconds later, the handle of the door rattled. Um, I don't have my swipe card, Professor. Leroy's muffled voice called. I saw the professor close his eyes in exasperation, and I went to the door and swiped the lock. Leroy had barely entered the room before he found the muzzle of my gun pressed under his flabby chin. His eyes widened as he surveyed the unexpected scene and raised his hands in quick surrender. I pulled his sidearm out of the holster and pushed him towards the cot. He sat down, the cot groaning as his ample weight was added to that of the other two men. Very good. Ben, zip tie Leroy, please. With the three men safely secured, I paused to silently give thanks at how smoothly we had been able to handle the unexpected interception. Would our good luck hold, though? Come on, I said. Grab your knives. Toby, you help Paul. Isaac, you're not bringing him, are you? Yes, I said. Luke threw his arms in the air. Dude, what the fuck? He nearly got you killed. Paul, his hair matted with blood and his face pale, looked at the floor. He's right. Just leave me here, Isaac. What did he promise you, Paul? He hesitated before answering quietly. He was going to let me share a room with Ava to look after her until she had the baby. You can forget that now, snapped the professor. You and your sister will be executed for your interference, just like these two. Not the other girls, though. I need them. I saw Luke move. But it was Ava, Paul's sister, who stomped up to the professor and slapped him hard across the face. 
He looked shocked, the stark white handprint on his cheek a vivid exclamation point. Then she began to hit him again and again and screamed, We're not an experiment, you psycho! The professor fell against Rag, trying to shelter from the storm of the young girl's rage. I ran to pull her away, but I was too late. With a sudden lunge, Rag shot up from the cot like a piston, the top of his head connecting with the girl's chin. It made a horrible noise and she fell backwards like a chopped tree, her head smacking into the linoleum floor with a crack. I attacked Rag, punching him viciously in the jaw and then the stomach. He fell back on the cot and attempted to pull back his legs for a kick, but I was on him, pummeling his chest and face. I heard Paul, his face still bloody from his own injuries, crying as he stumbled over to his sister and fell to his knees by her side. It was Indigo and Luke who pulled me off Rag. Come on, Isaac. We have to go. We're running out of time. I allowed myself to be pulled away, noting that apart from a bleeding lip and a red mark on his jaw, my frenzied attack at close range hadn't done much damage to Rag. He maneuvered himself back into a sitting position his glasses askew and his eyes just a little more determined than they had been a few minutes ago. All right, let's go. They were right. The longer this went on, the more likely we were to not succeed. And now we had an unconscious Ava to carry, as well as a probably concussed Paul. Ben, Toby, and Bo all moved to help Ava and her brother. Luke didn't object to Paul coming now. I think he, like me, could see that Paul's motives had been out of concern for his sister, and not any ill will towards us. Besides, there was no way we could, in good conscience, leave them in the hands of the professor. We finished picking up the makeshift weapons and the guns. One of the knives was unaccounted for, but we didn't have time to do more than a quick search for it. I put the Berettas of the three Homeland Guards in my backpack, opting against giving them out. If at any stage it came to a firefight, we were as good as dead. And while I wasn't admitting defeat, if we happened to be halted, we would be in a better position to negotiate and survive if our group wasn't bristling with loaded guns. I ushered everyone through the door and was about to pull it shut when I thought of something. Professor, don't use the virus against the Chinese. There is a group working against the government trying to change things for those of us that are left. Killing thousands of innocent people won't bring back the USA. It will only make you more of a murderer. I didn't expect an answer, and I didn't get one. He simply looked at me defiantly, as opposed to the ever-present dead-eye stare of Mr. Rag sitting beside him and the dumb menace of Leroy on the end. <laughs>